Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Physics Colloquium. Today, with a great pleasure, I would like to introduce our invited speaker, Saren Holdsworth. Saren is an undergraduate student. Just one second. Uh, he is graduating in the advanced physics uh, concentration with departmental honors. Uh, he has consistently been on president's list with uh, GPA uh, 4.0. Uh, he is an author of journal publication and several of the publications are in preparation. Uh, he's also, he has industry experience by having worked at the Southern Research Institute System Design and Development Division. And he is currently working on the uh, uh, sponsorship and mentorship of uh, Dr. Ryoichi Kawai. Uh, today, Theron will present a talk, will present a talk, heat pump driven solely by quantum entanglement. Just one second. Thank you for a very kind introduction and thank you for letting me see. Uh, let's see if I can admit a few more people here. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah. So I'm Theron Holdworth, and uh, this has been a project that has uh, been in prod in, in with Dr. Kawai and uh, oh, there's, there's, uh, Dr. Kawai mm -hmm. and Garrett Van Dyke. Okay, so I think we can begin. Yeah, so today I'll uh, start to motivate this topic by discussing the interplay between first, but certainly interplay between thermodynamics and information, then to discuss its effects in quantum mechanics, we will discuss the correlations and entropy, followed by our work in studying uh, anomalous energy flow between pairs of qubits that will then be extended to the heat baths with, to consider anomalous heat flow between two qubits. Then we'll see how we can exploit this effect to create a heat pump protocol and finally, how efficiency can be affected by studying uh, uh, sorry. by studying uh, a quantum communication protocol known as teleportation. So, just to begin, uh, I'll remind you of what the second law of thermodynamics is in two of its historically state two historic statements. They are the Kelvin-Planck statement and the Clausius statement. So the Kelvin-Planck statement says that there's no thermodynamic transformation whose sole effect is to extract work from a single heat path. And then the Clausius statement will tell you that there's no thermodynamic transformation whose sole effect is to move heat from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir without doing any external work. And this was shown to have an equivalence by Carnot who generalized this uh, Carnot efficiency. And this will go into like Carnot engines and such, where he'll say that there's no thermodynamic cycle operating between two heat baths that can exceed the Carnot efficiency. And these are all properties and uh, things of what we, and characteristics of something that we now describe as the entropy function, which is known, uh, usually known and denoted by S. So we would say that the change in the entropy is always monotonically increasing in a closed system. And this has always been very important in the study of physics. And there's the, the famous, very famous quote from Einstein and Sir Arthur Eddington shown here. A very nice picture of them. So uh, Einstein would say that the second law of thermodynamics is the only physical theory, which will never be overthrown. <laughs> and then Eddington, who is very famous for uh, his work on coining the notion of the arrow of time. So he would consider that the time asymmetry between physical processes, he would argue as give, be giving rise from this property of the entropy function. So the fact that time seems to flow in only one direction, he would attribute to the entropy and say that the law of entropy increasing always holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. But we'll actually see that quantum mechanics can challenge some of these statements in a very subtle way. So. Recently, there was, uh, or I would say recently, within the past few decades, in 2003, Marlon Scully had uh, 
suggested a scheme for violating the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law of thermodynamics by considering a, a system that can extract useful work from a single heat bath. And it would go something like the same type of setup that uh, Stern and Gerlach would uh, classically study. So initially there would be a beam of spin one half particles that would enter a hot boiler. And when they exit, they would be in a mixture of excited and ground state. And from there, the, those, uh, that mixture, uh, in this case, it'd be a thermal mixture of this excited and ground state would enter a stern Gerlach apparatus where they would be separated based on their spin into high and low energy. So in one portion, you would get high energy going into one path and then lower energy in the ground state of these beam of particles into the lower path. Then once these high energy particles are allowed to couple to a single resonant mode of this maser, then the higher energy particle can stimulate the emission of a coherent photon, which is shown here, and be sent to a receiver to do useful work before now both of these particles are now in the ground state. And then we'll, well, you could think that this may seems to violate the second law of thermodynamics. We've used one temperature bath to extract work. But if you notice this, what, what is here, this is acting something like what we've described as a Maxwell demon, such that we had this thermal mixture and now it seems like something is going on here that is separating them and being able to do work. So uh, this is very, very paradoxical. So we'll need to refresh on what the, what the study of the demon actually was. And this is one of the papers that I had suggested. It's a very nice review uh, from Moriyama and Black of the Drill. So Maxwell had suggested this back in the 1800s um, this notion of a tiny intelligent being that could observe single atoms and direct them one by one in an orderly way. So the demon would say, slow ones to the right and fast ones to the left. And it's been reimagined many, 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 many times. <laughs> There's a lot of pictures like this one. So usually it's pictured as this small being who operates this door between two rooms, and he would be able to observe particles entering from one way and allow higher energy particles to pass from one room to the other until there is a appreciable energy difference between the two. And this was uh, very paradoxical for a while. And now it's been uh, very well studied. So what, um, where this actually arose from was Maxwell was sending letters to his friend, uh, the mathematical physicist, Peter Tate, when he was asking for uh, more intuition and more knowledge about the second law. And I think this quote from some of his correspondence sums up the, the nature of the demon quite well. So he would, Maxwell would say, the hot system has gotten hotter and the cold colder, yet no work has been done. Only the intelligence of a very observant and neat fingered being has been employed. So already we can, uh, we can start to motivate how this demon actually was exercised is uh, this notion of a finite being operating by some intelligence. So that's what uh, I'll now introduce in this model to, to understand how the demon actually is at play. And that's what I'll call this information Maxwell demon. So if we present the demon with this box here, this box has a set of elastic particles that are in, uh, initially in thermal equilibrium. And then what we'll do is we'll partition the box. And in this case, we'll just consider that there are eight, eight particles within this box. We'll partition the box. And then from the demon's point of view, the demon has just eight registers where he'll just register the first bit as the position of the particle with respect to this partition and the second bit as the energy of each particle. So you can see that a zero zero would indicate a low energy bit on a low energy particle on the left side of the box. And a one one is a high energy particle on the right side of the box. And thusly for the zero one and one one. So the actual operation of sorting is the demon taking a zero one and see and making a measurement as it approaches this door and then allowing it to pass and then re, re, uh, remarking it as a one one. And then he would allow the high energy or uh, low energy particle on the right to pass back to the left until the, such a time that he has ordered them to where there are high energy particles and low energy particles. 
And then uh, this seems to violate the second law of thermodynamics as we understand it. But now let's just uh, ask him to continue. Okay, so now we will allow this high energy particles to uh, interact with the wall. We allow the wall to move. The particles would do some work on the wall and then they'll come to a point where they must stop. Then we'll say, all right, let's, let's, let's extract some more work. So we'll remove the partition, allow these particles to come back to equilibrium. But now the demon is uncertain as to which particles are high energy and low energy. And you can see that the, what, what, what was actually going on in the first bit is these first bits only indicated the position with respect to the partition. So there is no uncertainty in those bits because as soon as we replace the partition, he'll be absolutely certain as to which particles are on which side. But in order to regain certainty on the energy, he has to go and make new measurements. But he only has this finite amount of energy. So whatever uncertainty he had in these energy bits must be replaced. And so this is where this concept of erasure has to come in, is that with 50% probability, in order to erase this with 50% probability, he can only just flip this bit back to a zero or one. And that will return us back to this thermal equilibrium state. But some information had to be erased from his memory. And then we can repartition the wall and return to the initial state. And this was actually how the demon was exercised, is by considering that this information had a real effect on the entropy production within this system. And this has had uh, far-reaching implications for uh, thermodynamics. So uh, it was noted by Zillard, actually the situation that we just considered is very similar to a Zillard engine. And this was uh, noted by him back in the 1930s. And then it wasn't until the uh, actually 1960s that Ralph Landauer had exercised this demon by introducing this principle of erasure as a uh, contribution to the entropy production within this system. And then by the 1970s, Charlie Bennett and others were talking about the absolute limits for classical computation as the, uh, in terms of a land hour limit. So if we just saw that one bit of information uh, actually contributed to the entry production, when you consider that classical gates take in two bits of information and only output one, this will necessarily lead to some loss within the system. And then uh, later on, there was, uh, by the 1980s, uh, Fred and Copley had in introduced this conservative logic. So they could, um, so they would introduce this notion of a reversible computer that conserves the logic uh, by doing this. And nowadays there are these uh, conservative logic gates of the Fredkin and Toffley gate named, in their namesake. And Late in the in within the same time period in the 1980s, Richard Feynman had given his now famous speech uh, to the uh, MIT computation series of computation conference, and in his speech on simulating physics with computers, he actually credits his discussions with Fredkin for inspiring many of his ideas. In the same uh, speech where he had introduced quantum computing, so by their very nature, quantum computers are reversible computers, and this type of study is very important to the future of this kind of topics. So all that aside, the important takeaway is that information is physical and it has a very important um, implications for our study of physics. So now when we want to move into the quantum case where we want to see what the effect of that quantum information now has on our study of thermodynamics, we can proceed like this. So now we'll just review some notions of correlations because correlations become very important in the quantum <clears throat> in the quantum realm. So if we begin by considering a probability distribution over a random variable x that has outcome x and a probability distribution over another random variable y that has outcomes y, which we'll denote here p subscript capital X with outcomes little x, and P subscript capital Y with outcomes little y, we can denote the, the, uh, the notion of a joint probability distribution between both of these random variables, P capital X, Y with outcomes X and Y. Right now, what these diagrams are actually showing 
by the amount of information that is measured by the Shannon entropy of this random variable. So the Shannon entropy is the negative sum of the outcome P of I log P of I. And then this is the log two, so this be measured in bits. Yes, so from this diagram, we can already see that if there is some shared information here where uh, this blue circle is indicating the information of this random variable X, and the orange circle is indicating the information of random variable Y, the mutual information here, which we denote I of X, Y, can be considered as the degree of correlation between these two random variables. And we can define it as the, uh, the Shannon entropy of the random variable X plus the Shannon entropy of the random variable Y minus the Shannon entropy of the joint variable, uh, the joint probability distribution. But we can also define it in terms of another quantity known as the relative entropy. And I must note that the relative entropy will say that, uh, will tell you the difference between, or uh, I'm sorry, it will tell you a distance between two probability distributions. It is a measure of closeness. It's not a true metric, but it will tell you something about how close these are. So if you consider that this is the, you can break this out into the difference of these two logs, and it has some important uh, properties, namely that the relative entropy is always positive and equals zero if and only if here P is equal to Q. So only if the two probability distributions you're considering are the same is this quantity ever zero. So this can, using this, we can, uh, we can define the mutual information as the distance from joint probability distribution to a, uh, a separable probability distribution, where we would like to know that the probability of X and the probability of Y are independent. So here, if, uh, if the relative entropy is zero, then we consider these probability, these random variables uncorrelated. But if it's greater than zero, then these are called correlated. And we can define a new function that can be that can stand as the difference between the, so the difference between the joint probability distribution and an independent probability distribution over two variables. So now, when we move to the quantum case, everything has an analog without too much loss of generality, and now the probability distribution gets replaced with a density matrix, this ensemble of pure states, and then the uh, then we can define a reduced density matrix over one subsystem. So here we have a Hilbert space over two uh, random variables. We can consider this one subsystem labeled X and one subsystem labeled Y. And so we can consider a reduced density matrix by tracing over the other subsystem. So if I wanna consider a density, the states on system X, we just trace over the system Y. And lastly, the Shannon entropy gets replaced with the von Neumann entropy, and then we can continue. So the analog of the mutual information in the quantum case would be considered as the quantum mutual information. And again, it is the sum of the von Neumann entropy for the first variable, plus the sum of the von Neumann entropy for the second subsystem, minus the von Neumann entropy for the total state. And now we can consider the total state of this two uh, subsystems, rho of x, y. Now, what we would like to know is the relative entropy between any total state, rho of x, y, and a separable state on, this, on, this two, uh, on these two distributions. So again, we can use the relative entropy, noting that there, the logarithm must be, uh, be defined with respect to the matrices. Again, it has, uh, the same properties that the relative entropy is always positive and equals zero if and only if, in this case, these two matrices, rho and sigma, equal are equal. They are the same. So now, since we are in the complex uh, Hilbert space, we have to generalize this notion just a little bit, where now we can say the, the relative entropy will tell you the distance between any, any given uh, bipartite state, any composite state, any, uh, any state here on row of x, y, the distance from this state to the set of separable states. 
because a set of separable states will be uncorrelated. And here, these would necessarily be correlated. So if this quantity equals zero, then we'll call this uncorrelated. If the relative entropy is zero, we call this uncorrelated. And that means that this state is separable. And then if this quantity is greater than zero, then the, the total state cannot be written as a separable state. And we call this correlated. And this also is the condition for uh, a, a particular density matrix to have entanglement between these two subsystems. But since we've generalized this density matrix, this necessarily includes both quantum and classical correlations. So this is something we'll be careful about as we proceed. And the one thing that I would like to note from the end of this is that using this, again, we can define a correlation matrix chi as the difference between the, uh, the total state minus a separable state on both of these Hilbert faces. So rearranging this, if we have just any given uh, row of xy as a total state on the Hilbert face xy, then we can write it as a sum of a separable portion and this correlated portion. And that's how we'll motivate this next portion, where we take initial state of row AB, where this is the state shown here on the right, a system which will denote A and a system we denote B, and they're coupled through this potential VAB. So respectively, they will have a Hamiltonian for the system A, Hamiltonian for the system B, and a Hamiltonian for uh, the interaction term. Initially, each subsystem will be in a Gibbs state. So this is very reminiscent of a, a thermal state where it's defined at in inverse temperature where TA is initially greater than TB and ZAB is the respective partition functions for each subsystem. Now, note the inclusion of this general correlation term. The time evolution can then be considered by the von Neumann equation just by considering the, uh, the commutation between this total Hamiltonian and the entire state. Now we can consider the evolution of the local energy by uh, the subsystem A energy with time as the tracing over the Hamiltonian system A and the total state, likewise for system B. Next, we would just like to know as a restriction just what the change in entropy is over time as this system is evolving. And again, we can use the relative entropy between the time evolved state and the initial state. And again, this will have two terms to it uh, because we break it, break this out into a trace of these each of these logarithms. And this quantity will always be greater than zero. So when we actually solve this, we can identify two terms uh, for each subsystem, one indicating the change in the entropy and one indicating the change in the energy, where we define the change in S and of the change in entropy of A and B with uh, as the, 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 the entropy at time t minus the initial entropy. And likewise for the energy at time t minus the initial energy in each system. So these are just restrictions on the evolution of this specific system in an isolated case. This may remind you of something like the fundamental relation, but this we haven't taken this to a thermodynamic limit yet. So this is just considered as energy evolving over time. And now we can consider the composite state by noting that the unitary evolution in this isolated system conserves the energy and the von Neumann entropy. So we can calculate uh, a similar expression like we had just found to the composite state where we sum these two terms, but we also have to consider the inclusion of the mutual information because we had included a correlation in our initial state. So this mutual information, uh, the change in the mutual information delta of I B is I uh, time T minus I naught. And this quantity is always negative because we've defined mutual information as always positive from the relative entropy for all time T. So now we can immediately see two interesting cases. The first case is that if delta I A B equals zero, this meant that the system was uncorrelated initially. So then this quantity on the right will be positive, And that means the quantity on the left is positive. 
And this indicates that energy flows from hot to cold as expected. But if the change in the mutual information is greater than this quantity on the right, then the, this expression on the right will be negative, meaning that the expression on the left will be negative. And this indicates that energy is actually flowing in the reverse direction. Energy flows from cold to hot in violation of the Clausius statement. And this was also, uh, these types of expressions were also studied uh, by Seth Lloyd back in 89 and more recently by Barry Riera, Lewinstein and Winter back in 2017. But this is quite, quite interesting. Uh, let's see. Yeah, but now uh, back in 2019, this is actually experimentally demonstrated by this group of Makati et al. And this had actually inspired some of our first work where now we can theoretically show everything up to this point. Uh, and now we can show, uh, give credence for why this uh, effect actually happens. So again, we'll consider the same two uh, interesting cases where there's init initially uncorrelated systems where the mutual information is zero and initially correlated systems where the mutual information is non-zero. So in the initially uncorrelated case, if there are two spins at one temperature hot, and they'll call this hot, it's at a higher energy. So this is one qubit that's at a higher energy. And then another qubit that's at a lower energy, they'll call cold. When these two qubits interact, the heat flow or the energy flow between these two qubits would be as expected from hot to cold until they reach this thermal equilibrium, which they call warm. But if there's an initial correlation in this local thermal equilibrium, then they know that there can be a reversed heat flow against the temperature gradient. So such a time that the cold qubit can actually get colder and the hot qubit can actually get hotter. And this is very reminiscent of what we just saw with the Maxwell demon. So then we can, uh, we can analyze some of their data that they provided here in the initially uncorrelated, initially correlated case. So here a hot qubit will cool over time and the initially correlated case, it heats over time and vice versa for the cold qubit. But what I'd like you to note is what the actual initial behavior at time zero is. So at time equals zero, in the uncorrelated case, the slope is very close to zero here. But when it initially correlated, its slope is linearly increasing. This is very interesting because now we can take the exact same analysis that we had done earlier. But now instead of considering the limitations from the entropy, we can consider what the local energy difference is doing over time. So we only want to consider the progression of energy EA over time minus EB over time. And then we can use a Taylor approximation to approximate this time evolution. And we arrive at this expression. So in the first case, when chi is equal to zero, you can see that this term does not, does not or this term commutes. So then this entire term equals zero and all the higher order terms. And then this uh, initially, this uh, change in temperature is zero. So this tells you about the behavior of the normal heat flow. Initially, it is zero until it starts decreasing. And that's what we just saw. But if this term is non-zero, then the, uh, the heat can actually increase. Yeah, the difference can actually increase linearly with T. And so we can find this necessary condition that VAB, the coupling, and chi cannot commute. And then it is possible for the, an increase in the difference between these two, uh, in the energy between these two systems. Yes. So as an aside, as I was saying earlier, the initial state, when it has this correlation, it includes both quantum and classical correlations. So to just isolate the quantum correlations, we'll be measuring the amount of, amount of correlations using this two qubit measure called the concurrence. And the concurrence is very nice because it's, it's faithful. Um, oh, I see the comment. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll just, we'll, um, we'll denote the concurrence with uh, this curly C of row AB. And when it equals zero, there's no entanglement. When in there, it's greater than zero, it has some entanglement. And when it equals zero, then it, it's a maximum. So we would like to optimize our correlation matrix 
such that uh, we can obtain the maximum co concurrence uh, within this system. And then we can consider that we have as much effective entanglement as possible. So we'll consider that now this arbitrary chi is now denoted as chi optimized for this, uh, for this measure. Yes. So now for concreteness, we choose a specific Hamiltonian for each uh, system that we had considered earlier. So for A, now we consider this, um, yes, yeah, so we have a Hamiltonian for system A and B, which will be described just by a Pauli Z matrix described in or expressed in the computational basis of zero and one. And then we'll fix the time scale of the qubits such that H bar equals omega A equals omega B, this is one. So now the excitation energy is just unity. And this helps with our calculation. So now if we choose a particular coupling operator that's described in this way, it will have a magnitude omega and then a particular phase for each of these components that uh, describe the coupling. And this is not quite an arbitrary choice because by varying this phi V of this phase, then we can uh, find the familiar X, Y model, uh, Heisenberg model. Uh, it's a coupling within uh, familiar common Heisenberg models for these types of systems. And when we choose phi V to be pi by two, this is consistent with the asymmetric Dyshlesinski moria interaction. And this was actually what Makati et al. Uh, had used to obtain the reverse heat flow. And we'll see this uh, again shortly. So if we choose this initial state, it is diagonal in this eigenbasis of the computational basis. And it will have its four eigenvalues for each of these two levels. And the optimal matrix that we have optimized with respect to the concurrence previously looks like this. And you'll see that there's this important uh, phasing terms, which are chi, uh, what we call five chi. And this indicates the phase within, uh, uh, between these two, yeah, between these two, what do you call it? <laughs> yeah, between these two um, states. So, uh, yeah, so what we can see that when we're trying to satisfy the necessary condition, both the, uh, the, the commutation will depend on the relation between the coupling phase and this phi pi, the coherent phase, as we're kind of calling it. Yes. So now from this, we can input uh, all of these initial conditions that we just considered and optimized for. And we arrive at this analytical expression for the case of two isolated qubits. So here the terms are. Uh, delta naught as EA naught minus ED naught. And then small delta is the difference between phi pi and phi V. And then theta is, uh, yeah, it includes both of these terms and it goes like the sine of little delta, but it includes a term for the initial concurrence that we are able to include. So we can see that this, uh, this, Yes, so this, uh, this energy oscillates over time, as we show here. And we would like to highlight the special cases when delta can reach a, or when this reaches a maximum, when delta has three particular, two particular values. So when the normal, in normal energy exchange, and this is just what is expected in thermodynamics, the, phase between the coupling and the correlation is zero. And when we'll, what we'll call anomalous energy exchange is when heat actually, is actually reversed in the system is when uh, delta equals minus pi by two. And actually the energy exchange can actually be accelerated if you choose delta to be pi by two. And this is shown here by the black, red, and blue line in figure A. And within figure A, there is uh, another interesting, interesting, uh, interesting note is that the the state does have an initially high value of concurrence, has a very large amount of correlation, but the phase is equal to zero. 
So again, the necessary condition is not satisfied. Even though there is a correlation, this, this doesn't induce any uh, interesting dynamics. It's only when these are out of phase, when they do not commute and the necessary condition is satisfied, that we get this increase in, uh, in delta over time. And this will oscillate with the coupling constant. So we can change the period of these oscillations just by varying the coupling strength between these two qubits. And so you can see that initially, uh, when this reaches its first maximum, it's the concurrence is driven down while this is increasing. And likewise, the mutual information, which in this case would be the relative entropy, is also decreasing. So we can see this change in the mutual information that's actually driving this uh, reverse heat. So we have uh, this very nice expression for that controls all these parameters. And it helps us study a lot more in the, in the next case. But actually we can say a little bit further is that this is probably what was uh, observed here by Makati et al is these energy oscillations when they were considering this heating and cooling. But we haven't considered true heat yet. So these would probably just be the energy oscillations and would continue to oscillate out through time as long as this uh, system stayed coherent. Yes, so this is very nice. Oh, yeah, and this is, uh, this was even when, uh, it didn't even matter that uh, the system A is at a greater temperature than system B. Yes. So now, uh, in order to study the true thermodynamics, the true heat flow between uh, two systems, we'll consider another case where system A is comprised of a qubit and an entire heat bath with which will denote as R of A at temperature T A. And this qubit S A is coupled to the bath by its own qubit bath coupling. And it will contribute to the total Hamiltonian here. And this will be a likewise expression for system B, each of its Hamiltonian components. And the interaction between these two subsystems is again controlled by the interaction term between these two qubits, V, A, D. So now when, these, uh, the, when the temperature of system A is at a greater temperature, T, A, than T, B, we can uh, again use the von Neumann equation to calculate the, the time evolution of not the entire system, just these two qubits, S, A, and S, B. So in order to study the dynamics of just these two qubits, we need to trace out all the other bath degrees of freedom, Ra and Rb, when we would like to calculate this. But this makes this equation non-unitary, very difficult to solve analytically. So we invoke a method of hierarchical equations of motion to solve these types of open quantum systems exactly. And there's a very nice review from Tanamora uh, recently. It discusses more about this. So uh, this is just showing the what the initial thermal state actually looks like. Is that the qubit A at temperature T at uh, temperature two, which we just assigned to be two, does not evolve anymore. Its eigenvalues after some point in time, and likewise for qubit B at temperature one. And again, it is described by the Gibbs state at this certain temperature. So now we can uh, we can now go into um, some more specific cases where the two where the coupling and the fate and the correlation do commute and there is no concurrence. There's the chi is zero. So we can see for the entire time period here that the concurrence is zero. So these two systems are uncorrelated, and that the mutual information is very small initially. And we can see. What is expected from the natural heat flow is that over time, qubit B's heat increases and qubit A's heat decreases. And here, this heat current is indicating the direction and magnitude. It is the derivative of the net heat. So in this case, the direction of the heat flux is going into qubit B. So the heat current for uh, here shown in blue, qubit B, is positive because it is gaining heat over time. 
And likewise, uh, the heat current for qubit A is decreasing over time until it reaches the steady state, which is, uh, which is expected by classical thermodynamics. But if there is an initial correlation shown here where the, this initially there's a very, uh, you can't really see it too well, but there's a, a very large decrease in the concurrence uh, during the short period. And the mutual information is also non-zero here. And the coupling and the correlation do not commute because they're out of phase. Then we can see that these two red and blue lines have switched positions, indicating that the heat flux has actually changed direction for this short period of time. Well, while this first, well, and you can consider this analogously to the to the first energy oscillation we had seen earlier. And you can see here in the net heat that for this very short period, that the heat of qubit A was actually increasing and the heat of qubit B was actually decreasing. And this is very surprising, very interesting. So we've actually, in this, we've actually reversed the direction of heat between two heat baths. Uh, yes. And it has the same exact same conditions that we had uh, for the isolated qubit case. So now I'll describe how we can use this to create a heat pump. So if we begin by uh, breaking it up into four steps, where initially I have included this entanglement source just to show that this is not a perpetual motion machine. It still requires some entanglement to be brought into the system or distributed to the system in order to be consumed because that's what's actually fueling this heat pump. So here in step one, we have some entanglement being brought in. In step two, we move this entanglement into these targeted qubits that we would like to add the optimal chi to. Then once we know chi, we can then choose the particular phase of the coupling that we would like and couple these two qubits to reverse the direction of heat and then uncouple them very quickly so that they can reach a new thermal equilibrium at higher temperature. And that's what we showed here. So it actually turns out that the optimal coupling to find the first energy oscillation and stop it at its highest point, at its maximum, is pi over the coupling strength between these two qubits. And that occurs very shortly here. And this is about six time seconds. And then the heat is allowed to relax back into a new thermal equilibrium until we couple them again in the next, where we'd have to bring in another. Um, another portion of entanglement, add the correlation, and then reverse the direction of heat again. And here we are showing uh, in the dashed line the, what the normal heat flow would be between these two heat baths compared to what our engine would actually do, or excuse me, heat pump would actually do. Yes, so that's uh, how the heat pump would actually operate. Now we can consider the efficiency of such a heat pump. So the efficiency of a heat pump is defined by the coefficient of performance as the ratio of the heat extracted to the work applied. And this is limited by the second law, uh, this maximum here. And it's very similar to like a reversed Carnot efficiency. But in our, in our um, in our heat pump, we don't actually input any work. So for us, W equals zero, and therefore uh, the coefficient of performance diverges. So we actually have to consider the entry production per cycle given here in sigma. And by evaluating this delta S of AB, then we have to include the initial mutual information. And from here, we can rearrange to obtain this, this expression. And we can interpret this as the coefficient of performance where the second, yeah, this, this, this saves the second law because now we can define the work as the work potential stored in this initial uh, correlation that we had added to the system. So the, the efficiency is very closely related to how well we can add the correlation that I had shown previously here as this entanglement source. Yes. So that is uh, what 
our paper in progress will cover. And everything after this point uh, here in this last few slides is just considerations of how analysis and quantum information theory can help us improve our engine's efficiency by improving the initial state preparation. So uh, here I'm, I've shown some of the uh, some of the supplementary materials from McCarty et al's paper where they describe their protocol for adding the correlation between these two qubits. And here there's a there's a bunch of single qubit rotations and then some interactions. And then they have this field gradient and then a bunch of other parameters that they optimize for. But for our case, we have to be very careful not to disturb this Gibbs state because we've assumed that the Gibbs state was, was uh, fixed initially. So when we want to add this correlation, we need to know what the phase of the correlation is keeping the Gibbs state stable so that we can then pick the right coupling phase and then get an optimal reverse heat out of this. So this, when I, what I show here in one and two is <laughs> it would be a very ideal situation. So what we're thinking of doing is using uh, something known as teleportation to do, to do this. Uh, and to describe teleportation, it's, it's, it's a very simple calculation. I think it's very, very illuminating. So if we consider uh, two parties, which are Alice and Bob, and here they'll share this Bell state, which is the maximally entangled state between uh, two parties in this bipartite system. And if Alice has this unknown state with coefficients alpha, coefficients alpha and beta, then Alice can uh, actually teleport this, this state to Bob by, by a fairly, very simple means actually. So we can calculate this by expanding this tensor product. And then, so, then we can factor this into the states on Alice, which I'll we'll call Alice and then Alice prime. So this is Alice's system for this extra qubit. You can factor this and then substitute in these relations for the Bell state and find that if Alice makes a measurement and finds one, and uh, with the measurement outcome, she finds one of these states by measuring in this Bell basis, then Bob can actually, can actually receive, uh, I wouldn't say receive, but can actually get communicated what this uh, unknown state is just by performing a rotation conditional on what Alice had uh, what Alice had found, and that's what this picture says: is that if if Alice has this unknown state psi, then she can perform a Bell measurement between her portion of the state on this uh, maximally entangled state, and then communicate the results down to Bob, where this partition shows the uh, divide, division between the laboratories in space. And then at some point, Bob can telecorrect based on the communication. So Alice picks up the phone and says, uh, perform an X and a Z, and then you can recover the state that I had up here. So this is, this is quite phenomenal. And um, yeah, and this is described very well in this book from Dr. Lodi. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, you can just consider a much more simplified. <clears throat> consider the best outcome where Alice, Alice doesn't need to communicate to anything to Bob. So Bob does, when, when she makes the measurement, Bob ha already has the state ready for him. And it is the identity operation that he has to perform. Then you can draw a picture like this with respect to this division. And then you can take, you can take you can consider taking each end of these uh, the squiggly line and pulling it straight. And then you can consider this as this, this picture now looks like an identity operator, an identity channel between Alice and Bob. So this is why sometimes this is called a realization of an ideal quantum channels between two parties, Alice and Bob, is this teleportation protocol. And this is actually something known as Penrose's identity. So there's a duality between this zigzag and this straight line. And it, it has to do with the duality between these raising and lowering of the indices of these tensors. 
And here's a picture of Roger Penrose. I think he just won the Nobel Prize back in 2020. But now this is all very nicely described in uh, this paper, Tensor Networks. And it's very helpful for studying these kinds of, um, what do you call them? Quantum operations and other more complicated things. So yeah, but <laughs> I thought that was just funny. Yeah, so if you're familiar with uh, Rick and Morty, there's actually an episode that parodies the, the Terminator and they have to go back to Snake MIT. And at Snake MIT, the, <laughs> the snakes are studying the snake equation. And that's another name for this duality of Penrose's identity. So this is a graphical tensor network proof of Penrose's identity. I thought that was a funny Easter egg. But it's actually more funny because Seth Lloyd has talked about uh, teleportation and time travel <laughs> as a way of studying. If you can't remember the zigzag, then it's just a snake equation. So now there's actually a way of doing this between three parties in such a way that if we have now these three parties where Bob, Alice, and Charlie, so we'll call them Alice, Bob, and Charlie. If Alice and Charlie share this entangled state, and then Bob and Charlie share a portion of entangled state, then Charlie can make an operation on these two qubits and then communicate the results to Alice and Bob such that they can telecorrect to receive an entangled state between themselves. And you can notice that, again, there is still a partition between these two states. So Alice and Bob have never interacted, yet they have some correlation between them after this operation is done, just because of this action that Charlie has on their portions of their state. So this is what our next idea is for a, a more idealized or at least an easier way to study this uh, state preparation is that within the heat pump, you can, you can initially prepare two, uh, two entangled states within each of these subsystems and then have another party come and make a measurement on both of these, communicate the result to Alice and Bob and have them correct to then create entanglement between the two subsystems. And then you'll be able to know the phase. Then you can uh, pick the, the, yeah, then you know the correlation. Then you can choose the coupling that you like. And then you can reverse the direction of heat. Yes, so we're hoping that this would be uh, at least analyzable at some point in the future. Yeah, so just as our conclusion, we've seen how the initial correlations can result in heat flow if this necessary condition is satisfied. And we've uh, gone and studied the most simple case of two qubits and found an analytical expression for all the parameters that control this um, control this phenomenon. And uh, we proposed how this can be used to make a heat pump. And then we talked about how this was consistent with the second law. If we have to consider the mutual information's contribution to the uh, entry production. And then we proposed how to improve the initial state preparation by uh, using teleportation. And this just goes to show that quantum information theory will play a, a crucial role in thermodynamics and condensed matter physics moving forward. Yes, so that's the end of that. So if there are any questions. Very interesting talk. The floor is open for questions and uh, uh, let yeah. us take a look whether there are questions. Uh, here. Yeah. Hi, this is Mark Wilde. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we do. I have a question. Uh, thanks for your talk, Theron. Can you go back to the slide with the analytical calculation? You were showing the plots of anomalous heat flow and acceler accelerated heat flow. I think that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah, so um, our plots, okay, um, plots B and the plots are labeled by B and C, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, they're plotting the same physical system evolving, but different measures, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so um, it does seem if you track the, the evolution, that um, the concurrence is approximately equal to the mutual information. Is that right? Yes. Okay. 
Um, and in this case, you had not brought in the local heat baths. So they, this was actually a unitary evolution. Is that right? Correct. Oh, okay. And so this, this is what we would expect um, because all of the correlations would be due to entanglement? Correct. Okay. Um, why wouldn't you just use the von Neumann entropy here then? Well, <laughs> it, uh, okay. So in, in some of the other studies, we, they would use the discord to measure this right. correlation, but we, I didn't want to talk about like um, conditional probability distributions and the difference yeah. between local mutual information and global mutual information. But what I'm saying is that um, for bipartite pure states, the, the standard entanglement measure is, um, you know, the reduced von Neumann entropy. There's kind of like no other measure for, for okay. a variety of reasons. Okay. And it would generalize nicely to higher dimensions. Um, however, as soon as you go to mixed states, like when you have an environment, uh, the entanglement entropy is no longer any good. Mm, I see. Yeah. So we had initially considered this as the Gibbs state. So we are in a mixed state here initially. I'm not oh, sure. you are? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So I, I should have realized that. So then, um, well, then that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, I, I, um, I don't know actually how the concurrence compares to the mutual information, but it, it does seem that they're following each other very closely. Um, and like, it, it looks like maybe all of the correlations are due to entanglement, which is somehow surprising if you start with um, thermal states. Yes, yeah, so that's why we had optimized for this concurrence here. And then we can actually solve this and find that the concurrence is maximized when we choose chi to have this form. Okay. And we actually describe more uh, conditions, but you'll see that this actually does strongly depend on the initial state that we choose. And so there is a limitation on what the actual initial temperature between these are. Okay. So that's why another, we get uh, a maximum here, yeah. Okay, good, thank you. I have another minor comment. Can you go to the slide with entanglement swapping near the end? Yes. Oops. That was it. Yeah. So I don't know if this will be helpful for you. Um, but with entanglement swapping, you, you only need to send the classical data in one direction. Right. Um, you, know, you only need to send it to Alice or Bob. You don't have to send it to both. I don't know if that would simplify things for your thermodynamic yeah. setup. I was considering uh, drawing it that way, but then I had thought, how would Alice and Bob know if they weren't signaled? So then I figured if you did this symmetrically, just sending it to both of them, that maybe that could help somehow. I, yeah, I don't know if it's needed. Um, it seems like it just could be agreed upon beforehand, like who the data would be sent to. Oh, that's also true, yeah. All right, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions here? Please. Uh, we would like to slide 24. And you will repeat the question. So, yeah. so. so he had asked to return to slide 24. Okay. All uh, right. So um, I was uh, a bit confused by the mutual information plot. Um, from what I, I know, I thought the concurrence and the mutual information would be pretty much. Um, Directly proportional or equal. <coughs> and I noticed there's a small uh, sort of, instead of being uh, decreases the entire time, there's a little pump at the beginning with the mutual information. Yeah. So the question, uh, right. yeah, yeah. So the question is regarding the difference between the concurrence and the mutual information here in this case of heat flow. And this is very similar to the other question we had. So Actually, in the mixed state case, when we are considering the this open system, the mutual information is is not the same in uh, is not the same globally as it is locally for each subsystem. So there can actually be additional correlations, classically classical correlations, and the 
a correlation, another correlation called quantum discord. And the discord is a correlation that is neither quantum nor classical. It is induced by local measurements and it is a difference between local measurement and a global measurement. So that's why we were focusing here on the concurrence as driving this, um, driving this phenomenon. But the, the mutual information still behaves very similarly, but it's just more of an indicator that there is correlation and it doesn't tell you exactly which one. So that's why we wanted to focus on this concurrence. Yeah. I have a general question for you. Uh, what interest and practical applications of anomalous heat flow do you envision in the, in the future? Uh, so, the, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'll just repeat it one more time. So, he was asking about what interesting applications this might have. So, uh, let's see. I have two ideas. I've uh, just been uh, rocking around. So, if you could imagine running this in reverse, and then using this as a as an like an entropy purifier. So, there have been papers talking about using like if you could input work to this engine and then you'd have a very poor uh, entangled state and then to be able to get more correlation just by adding work that could be very interesting for quantum computing quantum uh, communications and then um what was another thing actually this is very similar to the kinds of entangling gates that are in quantum computers so it would operate something like this. Uh, let's see. I think there's one more thing. Yeah, and then when when you're doing these kinds of operations, actually there are sets of there are sets of uh, they're called quantum error avoiding codes that rely on the decoherence free states. So you can actually prepare, prepare decoherence free states between Alice and Bob initially, and then you can protect the entanglement there. And then this could act as sort of like a quantum memory. And then you can use this as uh, a means of storing some information locally and then being able to move and then operate on it afterward. So this is all very closely related to quantum information, quantum computation, things like that. Are there any other questions? If there are no questions, let us thank our speaker again for welcoming. Okay. On this note, I would like to close our meeting. Thank you very much. The best.